Beloved, as we continue in this series, I feel my help coming. I want to focus in now on Martha and Mary in John 11 because the dynamic of the raising of Lazarus from the dead is tied uniquely to the process Jesus takes Martha and Mary through. And as I've already established, when John writes, John is a master at pun, at hidden meaning, and what we call double entendre, where there are things that he's saying that have a double and more hidden meaning. And so there are so many things in John 11 that we could spend volumes and volumes of hours exploring and never plumb the depths of the infinite riches that John is by the Spirit revealing as it relates to the nature of the person of Christ and the walk of faith. And when we've established that this whole teaching is about feeling your help coming, I'm not talking about frivolous emotion. I'm not talking about the nature of sentimentality. I'm talking about a felt awareness and assurance. You know, it says that when, when Abraham came to the full assurance of faith, there was a process in Romans 4 whereby he came to the full assurance of faith. The old preacher used to say, it's better felt than telt. And feelings run much deeper than emotions. Your emotions will tell you what you like and dislike. You can have an emotional uh, attitude, and you do towards various things. You can like strawberry ice cream and dislike um, uh, vanilla ice cream. That depends on your personal preference. But your feeling of how you are supposed to live, deeply held values have a feeling component, and they inform you not just on what you like or dislike at an emotional level. They inform you on how you live. And so what you don't feel, you cannot heal. Very, very, very important. And, and when it comes to the realm of faith, faith is substantive. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And beloved, when we talk about something substantive, if I put my hand on a hot stove, I am going to feel that heat go through my body. When I come into, the, into contact with the relational aspect of faith, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by a rhema from Christ himself, so that faith, as we've already established, is relational. It's a relationship. I can't come into the presence of him who was and is and is about to arrive in my situation and your situation and not ultimately feel that. Faith is not void of feeling. Faith, in fact, is the very thing that releases a level of feeling. And again, I'm talking about something deeper than emotion. I'm talking about something that informs the way you live, and it's something that will resonate in your entire being. And so when we look at the story of Jesus, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, and you go through it systematically, you discover in the narrative that Jesus has to get Martha up and Mary up before he gets Lazarus up. Now stay with me. Look in John 11, look in John 11, where it says in verse 18, well, verse 17, now when Jesus came, he found that he, Lazarus, had already been in the tomb four days. He, f he found that he, Lazarus, had already been in the tomb four days. Now in the Greek, Greek scholars will tell you that this sentence is full of hidden insights, and we haven't got time. But there are, there are two ways of looking at this, because Jesus lives in the reality of his Father's world. Jesus said, when you pray, say, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy wishes, thy desires, thy dreams, thine intentions be done on earth as they are in heaven. Now, the Father's presence is the presence of life and the fullness of life, and the Father gives life to whom he wishes, and the Son has been given authority in the earth to give life to whom he wishes. 
God is not the God of the dead. God is the God of the living. So that when we understand the world Jesus lived in and the world he brought to bear on the world we live in, because Jesus lived in two worlds perfectly as one. He, he is the marriage between heaven and earth. He is the God-man, the eternal come into time, the infinite abiding in the finite, very God of very God, fully and truly human at the same time. Now that in essence, is the nature of who the Son of Man is. But he is Jacob's ladder who bridges the gap between heaven and earth. And so when he says, pray to the Father that what his wishes, his dreams, his yearnings, his intentions, his will is in heaven would happen on earth. There is no death in heaven. Theologian Walter Wink says heaven is the home of the possibles. Why? Because heaven is the place where Jesus says everything is possible to him who believes. Jesus also says in John's gospel earlier, anyone who believes in me and keeps my word shall never see death. Now, the Pharisees had a hard time with that, and they twisted those words and changed the word for see into taste. And Jesus was saying something far more profound. But he says, anyone who keeps my word will never see death. So when it says that Jesus found where Lazarus was, you need to understand there are things that only Jesus can find that have died in your life because they are in the presence of the Father who sees them and deals with them from a living perspective because God calls things that are not in our world as though they are, because they are in his world. And he's the God of the living and not the God of the dead. So when he says he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's referring to those that he knows intimately in his presence even now. Abraham is not dead, he lives. Isaac is not dead, he lives. Jacob is not dead, he lives. Because God is the God of the living. So Jesus doesn't see death the way those of us in a fallen world see death. He sees life. He knows where Lazarus is. And he's coming to wake him back up into this state, from this state of death into that which is life because he is the resurrection and the life. However, he can't do that until he first heals that which is going on in Martha and in Mary. Now, I've already established that at an internal level, there's a Bethany in you, there's a Martha in you, there's a Mary in you, and there's a Lazarus in you. Martha means bitter or bitterness. Mary means that one which was wished for, and Lazarus means God has helped me. Well, here's the thing I want you to see. There can be no raising up of that which helps you to fulfill your destiny until the Martha that wrestles bitterly with things in your life and the Mary that wishes and longs for the relationships that endure are reconciled and come together. Jesus has to lift them up and raise them up and heal them up. Now, I'm using that word up deliberately because the entire Gospel of John is a gospel that has two Greek words that are pervasive from beginning to end. Ana, up, kata, down. Ascending and descending. If the Son of Man be lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. And so there is, an, and, and it says he went down to the sea. I, I, I wish we had time. Beloved, there's a reason some of the great saints of the church spent their whole life in the Gospel of John because there's a universe of revelation here that you can get lost in and fall in love with Jesus at such profound levels that it will stagger your natural mind. And so here's Martha. Here's Martha. She hears that Jesus has come, and 
Bethany, we're told in verse 18, was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Now, Bethany means house of misery or house of depression. And Jerusalem means city of peace. And this Bethany is in close proximity to this city of peace. And oftentimes in our life, there is a very short distance between our sorrows and our awareness of his peace. So coming to a place of peace requires that the Prince of Peace reconcile all the diseased parts of us that are at war, oftentimes with ourselves, that need to be made at peace so that our help can come and we can actually feel our help coming. Aren't there moments in your life where you feel aliveness? And aren't there moments in your life where you feel like your soul is being pulled in a thousand one directions and you lose your ability to sense that feeling of aliveness? Absolutely. So when we hear someone say feelings don't matter, I would encourage them to go back and read through the scriptures. Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, yet he prayed fervently. Jesus, our high priest, is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And when you and I begin to realize that Jesus, in all sorts of ways, reveals in his person both emotional reality and feeling content, we can't just dismiss emotions and feelings. Yes, you are at the core spirit. You also are soul and you also live in a body. And you are spirit, soul, and body all at once. So you can't dissect yourself. So you may want to think your way out of every situation, but your thinking is going to fail you. And the renewing of your mind is a process that includes not just your thinking, it includes your willing, your perceiving, your emoting, and your feeling. Beloved, I want you to hear me. What you don't feel, you can't heal. And there is a dimension of faith that we need to have at a feeling level that can bring us into a healing dimension from the inside out, which is why John the Beloved also says in 1 John, Beloved, I would that you prosper and be in health, how? Even as your soul prospers. Well, when you're feeling dead, when you're feeling lifeless, when you're feeling torn, when you're feeling distressed, when you're feeling downcast, when you're feeling depressed, I promise you, your motivational level is at an all-time low. When you are feeling the dynamics of sustained disappointment, we're not just talking about temporary frustration and an emotional episode of anger. We're talking about sustained disappointment at a feeling level. It will impact you from the inside out. It will affect your energy level. It will affect your ability to cope with stress. All of that, Jesus wants to heal you from the inside out. And that's why I'm emphasizing that old phrase from the old time saints, I feel my help coming. Jesus stays outside of Bethany. He doesn't come into the territory where all the illness, all the sickness, all the lack of, of, of strength and life and vitality are taking place. He doesn't come into the house of depression. He stays outside. And if Mary is going to have an encounter, and if Martha is going to have an encounter with Jesus, they're going to have to meet him on his terms and on his territory. Martha heard that Jesus was coming. Now, for some of you right now, you're about to realize by the Holy Spirit from what I'm saying that there's a fresh coming of the Lord into your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Martha heard that Jesus was coming into her experience. Have you realized yet that in those areas, and Martha means bitterness, I want those areas in your heart where you have wrestled with anger, frustration, and guilt. Because those are the combinations that lead to bitterness, 
anger. By the way, frustration is just low-grade anger that builds until you get to the place where you are acting out of your anger and reacting and, and fomenting and doing all sorts of things, knee-jerk, trigger, emotional reactions. So anger and guilt, you put them together and you've got a recipe for what will become bitterness. And that stuff, watch this, that's the emotional dynamic. Guess where that takes place? Between your ears. Jesus was crucified at the place called the skull because the emotional content of your life takes place in the mind. The feeling content takes place in the heart. Martha is up here in the mind. Mary is down here in the heart. And if we can get Martha and Mary healed, Lazarus will then be able to be raised up. But we've got to get Martha and Mary healed first. So Jesus stays outside of the environment that is toxic now and full of death at every level. And Martha, however, in the midst of her struggle, her anger, her guilt, and you say, well, how do you know she's angry and guilty? Oh, what she says to Jesus reveals how angry and guilty she, she feels because she runs out to meet him where he is. So she meets him on the appropriate territory, and she says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, Mary is going to say the identical words to Jesus as we read it in the English. However, in the Greek, the order is going to change and the emphasis is going to change. And that's so important because if you miss that, you miss the whole nuance John is endeavoring to bring. So in the Greek, what Jesus hears Mary say, watch this, is, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. So if you had been here is her anger, and her guilt. My brother wouldn't have died is dealing with the death issue. So she's number one angry at Jesus for not showing up at the right time. She's angry because her brother is dead and she can't do anything about it. And she's also angry at herself that maybe she didn't ask soon enough for Jesus to show up. Because the day they sent for Jesus to come was actually the day that Lazarus actually ended up dying. So Martha is wrestling with guilt and anger, anger and guilt at an emotional level that when she comes into his presence and she's drawn to him, faith is still going to draw you to him because it's relational. She's processing her pain and Jesus begins to take her through this dynamic of healing because he goes on to say that he's the resurrection and the life and she says well I know on the last day and he says no 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 today will be the last day if you believe I am the resurrection and the life do you believe this and so what Jesus is going to do with Martha is help her realize first of all this sickness is not unto death it's from my father's glory and the if onlys are not valid in the presence of the God who is the living God your brother will rise again your help will come and will rise up out of the entombed place of disappointment but I need you to understand that I need to draw you away from your anger and your guilt because you're living up to your name which means bitter and I need you to surrender those things because your head is blocking the flow of my spirit and so right now and beloved we will pick up on Mary and Lazarus next week but right now I want you to realize Jesus draws Martha onto the ground of faith and it literally says Martha got up to go out and meet him and that word got up there when it says um, when she went to meet him that word literally implies she was moving into a new direction and then when he says I am the resurrection and she says yes Lord I believe she is being raised up to a dimension of resurrection life and she's letting go of her guilt and her anger and at an emotional level she's coming to peace 
in the presence of the Prince of Peace. Father, in the name of Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, I pray for the Martha in each one of us that wrestles with if only expecting you to have shown up on our timetable and expecting ourselves to have asked sooner because we prefer to beat ourselves up for not working hard enough to earn what we can't earn anyway that can only come by grace. I pray you would dissolve the if onlys that have gotten in the way of our journey of faith so that our help can come and we can feel it coming. I pray you raise us up into a whole new awareness, consciously and even at an unconscious level, of the fact that Jesus is resurrection and life. He is the resurrection and the life within us. And I pray that the I Am himself will reconcile and heal the anger and guilt that has gotten in the way of our ability to live in the present moment, the eternal moment of the now, where life wants to break in, where death has robbed us of the joy and peace that we can walk in as we believe that faith indeed changes reality. I thank you that faith is substantive, and as we abide in your presence and hear you, faith comes. So I thank you right now that faith is coming into that area where the Martha in us has been bound by anger and guilt. And I thank you that all of those emotions are being surrendered into a place of peace in the presence of the Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name. Now, beloved... If you have never, ever met Jesus yourself, I want to invite you to let Jesus be the Lord of your life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no woman, no boy, no girl comes to the Father but by him. There are many ways to Jesus, but there's only one way to the Father, and Jesus is the only way to the Father. He died for your sins, according to the Scripture. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again, according to the Scripture, appeared to many, and he's coming again at the end of the world to judge every living and dead person. I want you to have the assurance of salvation by grace, and I invite you, if you've never allowed him to be your Lord, to surrender to him now and simply say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life and all that I am and all that I have to you. Let him forgive you of your sin. Let him cleanse you and wash you. Let him regenerate you by his spirit so you can be what the Bible calls born again, so that you can walk in the life and the power of his resurrection. If you pray that prayer, I want you to call the number on the screen. I have some materials I want to put in your hand that can help you take the next easiest step. And I want you to get into a good local church where the Word of God is preached in an uncompromised fashion so your faith can grow in this relationship you are entering into with the Father and the Son by the power of His Spirit. God bless you.